You have a tweet about Shackleton saying, here's a photo of Shackleton's medical kit from his storied expedition to Antarctica in the 1910s. Some paragoric for pain, some laxatives. <laughs> Only the essentials. Would you put laxative under the essentials? Yeah. An anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> uh, when I worked as a ship doctor in Antarctica in 2018, I had a huge cabinet full of meds and even EKG machine. Um, so if you can comment sort of on that contrast, first of all, your own journey, how harsh was it? How difficult was it? And given that context, can you think about how hard Shackleton's journey was? I think the difference is unimaginably stark. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that the use of laxatives early in the 20th century and before that, it was they were used for a surprising number of ailments where they probably did not help at all. But um, I think that was a holdover from sort of the old theory of medicine, the humoral theory, where you have to balance the fluids in the body. And so causing people to vomit, causing them to have diarrhea, or purposely taking blood out of them in bloodletting was a big part. And I think the crazy use of laxatives was um, maybe a holdover from that time. But that being said, they were probably not eating very high fiber food um, on that expedition, so perhaps laxatives could have been um, helpful. You know, there's a lot of seal, um, penguin and seal meat being eaten, which is not super high in fiber. So I don't want to discount the importance of laxatives in that setting. But that wouldn't be the essential thing if you're thinking. Of, <laughs> if you're thinking of a tiny kit that has only the essentials, I mean, pain, yes, laxatives, I don't, maybe not. I think the the medical kit possibilities were much now narrow, narrower back then. You know, this was um, before antibiotics, before I think germ theory might have been. You know, it was known, but um, there wasn't much to do about it. Um, so the availability of medicines. I mean, that's something that exploded over the course of the 20th century. So what I can put in a backpack today filled with modern medications, whether injectable or to be taken orally is, you know, just um, many orders of magnitude greater than what they had back then. Um, so when I, I mean, when I went, my expedition was nothing like Shackleton's. I was on a huge cruise ship um, with 160 Japanese passengers who came with their own translators. Um, and, uh, as I said, I had a ca cabinet, not just one cabinet, many cabinets full of medications, um, both injectable, some patches, uh, some pills. Um, I was very impressed, actually, which, with what was available there. Um, and uh, I didn't have to use a, a lot of it, thankfully, though I did use some of it for people. Um, but, uh, and I, I slept and, you know, I got free room and board um, on the ship. So ev every southern summer, cruise ships uh, go take people to Antarctica, the Southern Atlantic Islands, like the Falklands and other other parts of the South Pacific. And then in the Northern summer, the same kind of cruise ship uh, explosion happens, you know, going to Greenland and Iceland and Svalbard and Franz Josef Land and other parts of the North Alaska. So, uh, and every ship needs a doctor. Um, so it's a great opportunity. They want specifically ER doctors, you know, to deal with emergencies, but, uh, you're really working in the middle of nowhere and all you have is the medications there on the ship and supplies and your knowledge and experience. And so it's it's a very different experience than working in a high-tech modern hospital with every bit of technology and every subspecialist consultant available. Um, but I sort of like that challenge. I mean, I like going to the ends of the earth. It's beautiful, it's exciting, it's fascinating. Um, practicing medicine in those settings is extra challenging and really um, makes you hone some of your skills, which is, part of the reason that I sought, sought them out. Do you uh, see echoes of some of that same effort? I've gotten a chance to interact with astronauts and those kinds of folks working on space missions. Do you see some of those same echoes of challenging efforts going out into space and maybe landing on Mars and maybe beginning to build a small colony on, on Mars? Yeah, I think the healthcare that is needed will be a big part of that. You know, obviously we're we're probably going to send overall quite healthy people, uh, but there's a lot of medical decisions to make about what should be brought, what should be expected. You know, to some extent, a lot I've had a lot of doctors say, "Oh my goodness, I can't believe you work in the middle of nowhere. What do you do if someone you know gets a brain bleed, like falls, hits their head, needs a neurosurgeon?" I mean, the obvious answer is they die. You know, when things when you're in the middle of Antarctica things kill you that wouldn't if you're inside a university hospital 
that's fully equipped to help with every problem that arises. Mm -hmm. um, Mars takes that to a crazy extreme, obviously. Um, I know that even going to Antarctica, different countries have had different strategies. I believe it was Australia used to kind of just in anticipation remove people's gallbladders uh, just so that it wouldn't get inflamed because that is a very common medical emergency. So they would just remove it beforehand even though it was not diseased at all. Just so that while they're stuck in Antarctica over the winter, for instance, um, that wouldn't be a problem. You know, there's many other issues that can arise. But so th those are some decisions to make. Maybe the people who go into Mars should have their appendix removed, their gallbladder removed. Maybe they should have a cardiac cath to see if they have coronary artery disease just to know their chances of getting a heart attack there, though it's not always predictive. You know, it's hard to predict who's going to get a heart attack. But maybe with all the data around today, we'll get, you know, better at predicting. But that will be a huge part. You know, we can't have people the few pe few pioneers in a Mars colony dying of heart attacks and things like so that. Anticipate stuff. Would you go, you've gone to some harsh conditions to be a doctor. Would you go to Mars to be a doctor? Um, it would definitely be amazing. I think because I have a wife and two small children, probably not uh, in the cards for me at this point, but. You humans with your human attachments. Sex and death. <laughs> <laughs> if you just put more priority on the death than the sex, I think we would be uh, better off. No. I would love to go to Mars. And actually, I, you know, I practice high altitude medicine in Nepal. Space medicine is sort of an extension of that. You know, the air is just much thinner, like non-existent. You know, as you go higher in the mountains, the things that happen to human physiology are very bizarre and strange and, and still not well explained by science. Um, and in space, it's just like a crazy extension of high altitude.